But on that note, we want to turn to uh, maybe the most critical existential issue overhanging everything we do every day, and that is the climate, the climate yeah. catastrophe we are currently in. And we are very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Cassie Siegel from the Center for Biodiversity. She's the director of the Senate's Climate Law Institute. Cassie, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the pleasure is all ours. And, you know, I want to start here with uh, those of us who are, I, I don't know, am I in the know? I don't know. Those of us who are quote unquote in the know, you know, you, you've read so much about this that when you see things like we have to prevent a one and a half degree warming and getting to two degrees, three degrees is dangerous. Uh, but what that really means, I think for a lot of people, it's not clear and it's a little obscured. So maybe just to set the tone, can you talk about what the stakes are in terms of the one and a half degrees warming and what happens once we get beyond that, that goal? There's many horrendous consequences of going beyond that 1.5 degree guardrail. And that's why government officials from the countries that are most at risk and climate activists everywhere for many years have been saying 1.5 to stay alive and two degrees is too much. Mm. And just a couple of examples. So above 1.5 degrees, these unheard of superstorms become more common. So Hurricane Ida that devastated the Gulf Coast, and then it moved up to the New York area. There was massive flooding. It killed 50 people. That type of deadly, horrible storm happens with more frequency and ferocity all over the world. Melting ice is another example. So melting ice causes sea level rise of one to three feet in this century. That puts four million people in U.S. coastal cities alone at risk. And then all over the world, Huge coastal cities like Saigon, Mumbai, Bangkok could be mostly underwater. And keeping warming under 1.5 degrees, it cuts that sea level rise in half, protects millions of people, not to mention our ice-dwelling friends like polar bears and penguins. And then because of ocean heat waves, another example is coral reefs. Over 1.5 degrees, we will have a complete loss of the world's coral reefs affecting marine ecosystems that will be starved of food resources. And if we keep warming below that, we can save a portion of, of the world's reefs or at least give them a chance. Wow. You know, Cassie, that, I mean, that sounds really terrifying what you just described. And of course, right now, it seems like no matter what party's in charge, we are conti we continue on this horrible path to just like climate ruin. And Biden has recently made a few decisions uh, that are going to make this worse. One of them is uh, adding ethanol into our gas. Uh, and then the other one is, of course, opening federal lands for oil companies to lease. Can you talk a bit about what these decisions mean um, and how it will actually impact uh, climate change? Yeah, so first on e ethanol, when you add ethanol, which is essentially alcohol, think of it like adding vodka to, to the gas tank, it actually increases the amount of ozone smog pollution that's produced when you drive the car. And ozone, um, it, it essentially burns our lungs. So it causes and exacerbates um, uh, diseases like asthma, particularly for children whose lungs are still developing, and then for the elderly who may have other respiratory illnesses. So adding ethanol, um, it, you know, it does not actually help the climate. It will not actually reduce gas prices hardly, if at, if at all, it's, it's, it's the wrong decision. The only way to protect people from the high prices at the pump, from the profiteering by big oil, is to get off oil altogether. We have the technology to do that. Um, so that, that, is, that is the only way to give people direct relief um, in, in the immediate term, as Congress did. Um, for COVID, but these gimmicks um, like ethanol are absolutely the, the wrong direction. And then, um, and then on, on the oil leasing, and I, I think this is implicit in your question, but just to say, fossil fuels are what causes climate change. 85% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions come from oil, gas, and coal. Y yes, of course, there's other things that contribute, but that is by far number one 
and the fossil fuel executives who decided to lie about the science and block alternatives to their dirty products, and they're still doing it today, that is the primary cause. And nobody has more direct power to stop the growth of fossil fuels than Joe Biden. And his actions overall have been a mix of things that are not good enough and then things that take us in exactly the wrong direction, like the recent decision to restart the leasing program. Uh, you know, the, the federal government owns and holds in trust for the public tremendous amounts of oil, gas, and coal rights. And it is madness for the U.S. government to keep auctioning these off um, for development. So every single step in this program, every lease sale will be protested by people all around the country um, and will be challenged in court because it's just an absolutely disastrous decision. You know, it just I'm glad you brought up the issue of the technology, because I feel especially with this issue of the oil and gas leases, I mean, it feels certainly the fossil fuel companies are obviously promoting this. But it, I think that there is still this lingering sense in people's minds that, yes, it would be good to just get into all clean energy, but that somehow we actually can't do that yet or that there's something that's missing or whatever it may be. So I was hoping you could speak to that, because I do think that misconception plays a big role in why people are sort of like, well, it'd be nice to do more, but what can we really do? Yeah, so, um, so you know, the, the, the passenger fleet is like the low-hanging fruit sector, right? I mean, the, 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 the electric zero-emission vehicles are on the road today. They are better than petroleum cars, and they're getting cheaper all the time. Um, and, you know, in that, so, so there are other sectors that are a little bit more challenging, like aviation, as you <laughs> were just talking about, a little bit more challenging. I mean, the, the, the airline industry has promoted this misconception that there's nothing that can be done. That's actually completely false. Mm. There's a huge amount that can be done on aviation just in terms of efficiency improvements and um and electric and hybrid electric aircraft which are actually coming online even in the absence of regulation and then of course it's not just electrification we need to have um clean mass transit that's free or much much more affordable um than it is today that reduces car ownership um and reduces the amount of miles driven and with that and other investments in our urban cores we make life better and we rapidly reduce greenhouse pollution. There is so much that can be done, and that is what keeps me going in this work, is that the things that we need to do to solve the climate crisis are the same things that are going to make a uh, safer, better, more equitable world for everybody. You know, I I think that a question I often end up asking people who are involved in the kind of work you're involved in is, you know, you mentioned how for so long these oil executives were lying to us, but they're, you know, and they're still lying. But for the most part, a lot of people, especially younger people, are fully aware that fossil fuels are the problem. This is causing climate change. And it seems to me that one of the ways that people are kind of kept, um, you know, from causing a riot over this is this sort of enforced feeling of helplessness. Like, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Like it's out of our hands at this point. We just don't control things. So like that's, a, how do you deal with that issue? How do you deal with getting people also with the climate issue for a lot of people, it seems so abstract, right? We see these big climate events, like these forest fire, you know, like these, these massive like wildfires, but if it doesn't affect you immediately, it's hard to see how it's going to like affect you in the long term. So how do you, as somebody involved in this climate work, get people fired up about this issue? Cause it is, it's kind of ironic. The most important issue that could cause like apocalyptic scenarios. And in a lot of parts of the world already has, you know, it's hard to get people excited or angry enough about to like be in the streets about it. What do you do about that? Those are such good points. And that that sense of helplessness, that is no accident. Mm -hmm. The idea that that we all bear personal responsibility for climate change and that we would somehow solve climate change through personal actions was manufactured and relentlessly promoted by the fossil fuel industry, right? I mean, of course, of course, one will feel helpless if one thinks that one needs to try to solve climate change on our own, because the, the, the you know, emissions result 
from government policy that control the choices that are available to people, not from individual choices, but that's a myth that, 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 that we live with. And so that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then it's important to keep in mind that the government, you know, the technology, this is never, in my whole career, I've been working on this since the 1990s, it's never been a question of technology. It has always been a question of political will, right? And, um, and you know, it's never been a question of, of not enough information. Um, it's all, you know, it is the relentless opposition from the oil industry at every level of government blocking the solutions, blocking the alternatives to their dirty products. And so I think understanding that is critical in our work. Um, my organization works with a uh, national coalition of groups fighting fossil fuel projects across the country at buildbackfossilfree.org. And we are building connections between the individual fossil fuel fights around the country because um, the fossil fuel industry is killing us, not just through climate change, of course, but through all phases of the filthy fossil fuel life cycle, the production and the refining and the transport. And so we're coming together to speak together loudly and clearly to, uh, to, to President Biden that we are out of time and that, that he needs to take these actions. It's absolutely achievable. And there is nothing that's more important than what President Biden does in the next three years. And we can come together and, 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 um, and force him to do that. And I think it's just really, for, for me, the most, I mean, people should get involved in the way that works for them, but it's not about individual action. Do those things um, if you want to, they're wonderful, but it's about political action and it, this, this is winnable. Mm -hmm. Well, one final thing before we let you go that I also do want to touch on, and that is the question to some degree of responsibility. I mean, we know that climate finance is a big issue, and I think that's sort of another thing that often gets sort of put out in the discourse is, well, you know, we need to do more, other people need to do more, and, you know, everyone is, is responsible, and it's not just the United States. And the idea that the United States doesn't have, A, a particular role to play, or B, did not play a particular historic role into getting us to this point, that I think also can kind of trip people up in some of the arguments about taking Taking bold action. Yeah, climate finance is incredibly important and there's many pieces of this. And so first governments need to stop financing and subsidizing fossil fuels. So the fossil fuel industry gets about $5 trillion in subsidies each year globally, tens of billion dollars from the US government. So that needs to stop. Private investors need to stop financing fossil fuels. That's why you see fossil fuel divestment movements growing and increasingly winning. And then the other piece, as you say, is the ongoing loss and damage around the world from climate's astronomical. And these damages were overwhelmingly caused by the wealthiest countries of the world, led by the United States. They're overwhelmingly suffered in the global south, developing nations, and their costs associated with all the harms we've been talking about, the sea level rise, superstorms, fires, droughts, crop damage, and so forth. And the Biden administration recently pledged to double payments to about $11 billion a year to help pay for this damage. But the fact is that's not nearly enough and the United States has broken its word many times in the past in this area. And so all that money, those billions of dollars um, that are going to fossil fuel companies need to pay for a clean, just energy transition that will help the people who are most suffering from this and will also help limit the warming instead of feeding the crisis, which is what the government is doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, Cassie, it was a pleasure. Really appreciate you joining us here on the show, helping us sort through all these thorny issues. I know your time is very valuable, so thanks so much for joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank, thank you so much for having me on.